Could you uh, state your name for me? Tempest Storm. Is that your real name? Yes, I had it changed legally in 1957. That's a beautiful name. That's, uh, Thank you. I've always liked stage names like that, like Rip Torn, or, or where they both go together. Lillian Hunt, when I started, she gave me the name Tempest Storm. I said, well, do you have another one in mind? She said, what about Sunny Day? I said, I really don't feel like a sunny day, <laughs> so I'll take Tempest Storm. I think that fits you much, much better. So I walk into her office, and she said to me, take your clothes off. I said, I beg your pardon? She said, well, I want to see if you have any scars. I said, trust me, I don't have any scars. But I took my top off, so I said, these are the famous words. I said, do you think my busts are too big for this business? And she said, of course not. She said, they can't be too big in my business. <laughs> so that's how I became Tempest Storm. <laughs> There's not too many businesses where that is the case, right? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and then the news media got together. They thought the um, Academy Awards were getting a little stuffy. So they thought of the Mickey Awards. And Phil Harris got an award for getting the most phone calls at the Brown Derby. And I got an, an award for having the biggest props in Hollywood. And the next day I was in the newspaper with Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis because they escorted me to this. And after that I was on my way. And that's how I became a star. and I, That was a break for you then? That was a break for me, the first break that I got, yes. So you're from Georgia, I read. Yes, from the deep south. It was called <laughs> Eastman, Georgia. Eastman, Georgia. Yeah. And I came from a very dirt-poor family. I picked cotton, and I chopped peanuts, dug them up out of the ground, and I pulled corn. I did everything. You are currently the oldest burlesque dancer in the world, is that true? Yes, I believe that's true. <laughs> I uh, Young at heart, of course. Yeah, I'm young at heart. I'm 25 and act 18 sometimes. <laughs> but you I, are 25, isn't that correct? Aren't you born on leap year? Yes, I have a birthday every four years. <laughs> that's the way to so, go. In so service, I think. I, I'm, I'm only 22, actually. <laughs> well, uh, one of the things that was really driving me to try to do something uh, uh, like a spoken word record work with you was because I saw this interview with you where you talked about being on stage and this story about your aunt that had yelled about your real father. Could you tell that story? Especially as, as how you talked about it being your reason that you like to be on stage or that you need to be on stage. I used to think my stepfather was my real father. And I used to meet him when he would come home from the fields and I'd run down the road to meet him. And he'd grab me up on his shoulders and i get home. And my aunt was over at the house that day. So when I opened the door to go meet my father, she says, that's not your real father. So after that, I blocked out totally everything out of my life. I could, just could not believe that he wasn't my father. And, of course, I never had any recollection of my, my real father. And that was a really terrible time in my life. And I still picture this little five-year-old out there all dressed up. And when I hit the stage, there's something, I can feel it. I feel like there's something just happens to my whole face. And like I see this little girl with this fancy little dress out on stage doing her number. And then I connect with the audience with my eyes and with my smile. And they give me unconditional love. There's something really interesting about that because you're taking a moment of your life and it's almost like you're, you're turning it into uh, an act in a play and you're using that to feed your energy on stage. It's really beautiful because you're taking a moment that's a painful moment and you're looking at it almost as if yeah. that little girl was on stage running in a pretty dress yes, to that, meet her father. And yeah. uh, I, I just think that's just a beautiful thing because uh, I think we all have... Uh, that are in show business or go on stage, try to find reasons to get up there. Now, why am I up here, you know? Exactly. What, what am I doing? And, and that was my reason for getting on stage. And as I say, you don't dwell on the bad things. You dwell on getting there and leaving that behind and become a happy person no matter what has happened in your life. And that has been my motto all my life. Don't dwell on the past. Just dwell on the happy future that's going to happen to you. Um, you're talking about the younger dancers nowadays and the kind of things they can get into, like drinking drugs and a more downgraded, obviously, a way dirtier version of dancing than burlesque once was, the, the romance of burlesque. 
We hear this quite often from burlesque dancers, you know, the, the way it used to be, and it's very romantic, and it, it makes us all imagine what, like, a strip club could be like. I think it was it started fading in the ni- 19... in the 60s. I know I was working uh, theaters, and they had... I had gone to London, and I worked in London, and I came back, and they... these girls had started... Uh, take a uh, flashing what they called in the theaters back east they call it flashing flashing they'd uh, have a certain way to flip their g-string up real fast and it would come down which i never did and they used to come to see my performance when they weren't performing and uh, they said well i don't understand this she's got him lined up down the street and she doesn't even flash <laughs> and so i never resorted to that and today it's not the burlesque that i knew I still, when I work, I do my my performance like I used to, real classy. That's what it's all about, being classy and leaving something to the imagination. Burlesque now is, uh, you know, actually what it, well, I don't know what that is they're doing out there. It's not what I call burlesque. Right. And uh, it's, it's, I, I don't take my clothes off in, on stage, but I make the audience think I will. You see, it's all in the art of the tease, and that is burlesque. Let's talk about Elvis. You were a friend of Elvis's for a minute, right? Yes, I was, the king. <laughs> yeah, I met him. I was headlining the Minsk Review at the Dunes Hotel in Las Vegas, and he came in to see the show. And after I met him, we kind of got up, you know, started talking to each other. Well, he actually... He had joined some of the course girls out in the lounge, and when I came out, I was had some friends I was sitting with that came in to, from, uh, I think it was from Chicago, and he walked over when he saw me. I'll never forget it. He kneeled down and was touching my skirt and looking up with those beautiful eyes. He said, could I join you? And I said, well, ask these gentlemen. They said, of course, join us. And after that, that's how we connected. We started going out together. And we had dinner, and we had a lot of good times. And he was a real southern gentleman, very, very polite. Except one night after he had left me, he called me about 2.30 in the morning. He says, could I come on over? And I said, well, I don't like to see a man come through the front, because there was only one way in to the dunes to get to your suite at that time. And so I said, I really don't like, you know, people know my business. I'm a very private person. He said, well, is there a back way? I said, well, I think there's a fence back there. And he said, well, I'll try that. So he came back, was getting over the fence, and he accidentally fell, and his pants caught on the railing. And by the time he got to my suite, he was half naked. I said, well, I guess I don't have to strip you now. (laughs) (laughs) Is he trying to show you your business? (laughs) (laughs) Right. But we had some very good times. Uh, I've heard stories about you being friends with President Kennedy, too. I'd love to know how the two of you met. Yes, that's true. But uh, actually, he wasn't the president when I met him. He was a senator. And uh, he and his entourage came into the Casino Royal, which was a real... This is the first time that I've had an exotic dancer to appear in this nightclub. And uh, he wanted to meet me, and I said, well, doesn't he have a wife? And they said, well, that doesn't matter. (laughs) I said, oh, really? I I think it matters to me. But then I took a look to see what he looked like, and I said, of course. I agreed to meet him, and uh, that's how I met him. And we had uh, the Mayflower Hotel was one of the posh hotels there, and we had many many dinners there, and that's where most of our meetings, and we ran down by the river, and the bodyguard followed us, and we ran down by the water, and he threw me down on the ground, and, you know, and we were just fooling around like, you know, like teenagers, <laughs> but it was exciting. It's not, not only about, you know, the closeness, it was about the greatness of these men, and uh, the James Gang. I, you know, I did a six weeks of one-nighters with that group, and we hit Carnegie Hall, and I'm the only exotic that's ever played Carnegie Hall. They thought I was a singer until I hit the stage. <laughs> so how long do you plan to keep on dancing? Forever. <laughs> Has everything you said been true today? Yes, it's been true. <laughs>